today I want to bring your attention to a global problem, and that is the use of synthetic pesticides. Did you know that approximately 98% of all insecticide and 95% of herbicide sprays never reach intended targets? Guess where they end up? Anybody? In our water supply, in our food, in the air we breathe. Now, the photo you're looking at is of a baby born to a mother that was exposed to synthetic pesticides. Now, I'm not here today to tell you about all the adverse effects and negative implications of the use of these compounds, because they do serve their purpose. In fact, they are important in feeding us. The rate of population growth, pesticides do have their use. However, the negative indication of them are far beyond what we want the positives to be. So, I want to introduce you to the alternative, green pesticides. Now, what are green pesticides? These are ecologically friendly alternative means of controlling pests that involves either biological means or organic compounds that are geared to a specific pest and specific insect that you're targeting. So unlike their synthetic counterparts where they don't discriminate, these are specific pesticides that are very selective in what they respond to. The butterfly on your screen is that of a citrus butterfly, commonly called citrus dog, dog butterfly, or Heraclitus angemon. I'm going to share with you a story and a few details from my research project, which involved controlling the feeding of this butterfly on citrus. And it started in 2006, where my then research supervisor, Dr. Trevor Yee, on one of his casual nature walks, saw a larva of this butterfly feeding on an alternative plant, Piper amalago. Now, why was that of any interest? They need to eat too, right? And they are eating these. But what we knew is the fact that insects tend to be very specific in terms of what they eat, as specific as a rasta who don't eat pork. <laughs> so when we saw these butterflies feeding on this Piper plant, we were wondering, hey, why is this happening? How come this is the first that we are seeing this and knowing of this occurrence? And of course, being good scientists, we asked several questions and we wanted to see if we could use that observation to deviate the feeding of these pests and potentially others from citrus to an alternative. And that's essentially what we did. Now, of course, to bring it all in context, why was it important for us to want to deviate the feeding? Now, these newspaper clippings give you an idea of the potential impact that these pests can have. And to give you a visual, this is what they actually do. In about a day or two, they can totally devastate this tree, leaving nothing but stems, right? So what were some of the questions we asked? We wanted to know, one, is it just by chance we saw this one larva feeding on this plant? Or is there something else at play? What will happen if we should give the larvae choice of both citrus and piper? Will they grow and develop um, as healthy as they would on, cit on piper as they do on citrus? What, are there any chemicals at play in causing this observation in terms of us seeing this larvae feeding on the piper plant? And ultimately, how can we manipulate these butterflies or their hosts in deviating their feeding from citrus to piper? And what did we do? Trying to answer those questions ourselves, as we tend to do, <laughs> we developed several experiments. The first set of experiments we wanted to look at was their feeding, feeding experiments to see how suitable was Piper as a host for these butterflies as citrus. We also wanted to look at host selection. Why did that butterfly choose to lay her eggs on Piper? Was she crazy? Was she going through some, you know, pregnant woman of a lot of symptoms? Was the butterfly experiencing something like that? So we wanted to know and to see what happens at the time when these butterflies choose to lay the eggs. And getting a deeper wisdom in terms of insect and how they go about selecting their host, we wanted to look at the essential oils. And combining all three of those experiments, we ultimately wanted to develop control methods of these insects, which will ultimately lead to the con the controlling these butterflies from feeding on pipe 
from feeling on citrus to selecting the alternative, Piper Amalago. And I'm going to share with you some of the results. Now, in our first set of experiments, which was our feeding or host plant suitability, we reared larvae both on Piper Amalago on, and on citrus. And what we found was there was no statistical difference between the growth and development of the larvae that was reared on citrus to those reared on the unknown host, Piper Amalago. So we're like, okay, so if we get them to be on Piper, they would be just as happy as if they're on citrus. Of course, you know, citrus is the economically important plant while Piper isn't. So let's see if we could actually do that. But first, let's, what happens? How will we get them to lay on the Piper? So we then did a host plant selection experiment. And those experiments entail us, those larvae that we reared on citrus and those that we reared on Piper, we exposed them both to Piper and citrus plant at the time for laying. And we wanted to see what would happen. And this experiment was very key in developing our control method. Because what we realized is that the plant on which the larva was reared was the plant on which the butterfly preferentially selected to lay on. Now you'll notice 98% of the larva that was reared on citrus lay their eggs back on citrus plants when given a choice. And 96, excuse me, I said 89, right? And 96% of the larvae that were reared on Piper preferentially chose to lay their eggs back on Piper. What's that? What's happening there? They somehow know, listen, this is what my mother grew up on, so this is where I'm going to lay. And this is what I fed on, so this is where I want my children to feed. It didn't make much sense. We couldn't quite understand it, but repeated experiments over and over, and it's the same results we were getting. And this was very key and fundamental to a method of um, development. We knew from these data that if we were somehow able to get the butterfly to selectively choose Piper over citrus, then the secondary generations will preferentially choose Piper over citrus. And in essence, you would have only needed one point of intervention, which is the first generation, getting them to select Piper in the first place, and all alternative generation would preferentially pick the piper plant, in essence, controlling the feeding on citrus. So I wanted to know now, what's the next question? How do we get them to select piper? And the cues, we believe, would have been in the essential oils. Because of course, insects, like most of us, respond to stimuli. And we knew or suspected that the first point of contact or first point of stimulus would have been what it is that they're sensing in their environment and your plants give off volatile cues, and those are found in the essential oils. So we analyzed the essential oils of all the different plants that we found these butterflies feeding on. And I think it's really by the grace of God or luck, but there was only one common ingredient in all of them, and that is D-limonene. So we now turn our attention to what we call our induced lane experiments. And what we did here was to present the adult butterfly, the gravid butterflies with several plant options. We gave them unsprayed lime, unsprayed piper plant, piper sprayed with D-limonene, because we wanted to see whether or not d was really the key component responsible for the selection of these um, plants, and also piper sprayed with lime. And what we noticed that happened. If you recall in the first set of experiments where the larvae that were reared on citrus chose 89% of those laid back on citrus, we saw a significant reduction in these larvae that was reared on citrus. Now, only approximately 45% of those went back and lay on citrus. All the others were laying on piper plants. There were other plants available for them to lay on. None laid on anything beside the citrus or piper plant, and more so on the piper plants that were sprayed with lime oil or d -limonene. And another key thing that we found there was no distinction in terms of how the butterflies interpret lime oil, the pure lime oil with all over 100 components versus the D-limonene, that single ingredient, D-limonene. That, that told us specifically that that is the key ingredient responsible for the selection of the host plant. So in essence, we were able to deviate the feeding and laying 
of these pests from citrus to a less economically important plant, which is Piper amalago. Now, what is the significance of all of this? Now, more so than us being able to develop a specific formulation, which would be made from the delimonene and lime oil, we're able to show you an alternative means of controlling pests in general the methodology and ideology used to develop these methods is not just specific just to do this citrus pest. It can be used for other insects and other kind of pests. And in fact, I'm very proud to say one of the spin-offs from this experiment is the fact that we're now faced with a citrus greening disease, which is a bacterial infection spread by a tiny insect. And because of knowing what we're able to accomplish with, through these experiments, we were approached by one of the major citrus um, growers to see if our way of thinking, our kind of methodology can be used in deviating the growth of the, the infestation of those plants. We have developed, a, we have boosted in the local industry. We have developed a very cost effective way of managing these pests and I'll, of course, leading to overall preservation of health and the environment on a whole.